Welcome to Mountain View Church. We are home for the wanderer and rest for the weary. And you're listening to this Sunday sermon. Made for more. And today's topic is made for more than what's offered to us in our culture and what the default position of our culture is. Not to be embattled against culture, but to love it. But we're made for more. We're made to be uh, different. And today's topic from John chapter 6 is the idea that we're made for humility. You know, Brenda and I were at an airport rest, uh, restaurant some time ago, and I, uh, I caught the eye of a little guy who was in a high chair, but I suppose he, he might have been a year old, cute as a bug, and sort of across the room, maybe as far away as halfway from me to the chairs. And I noticed, and he's just staring at me, and I'm staring at him, and, and he, he shook his head like this at me and smiled. And his parents weren't aware of what was going on. He's in the high chair, they're doing their deal. And so I, it's just him and me having this moment, right? And so I did like this, and he giggled, and then he goes, and then I went, and he giggled again. And then I, th- I thought, I'm going to have an experiment. I'm going to see if he'll copy what I do. So I went, and he went, and I went. And he laughed like crazy and went, and then I went, and he went. It was so cute. And then I went, and he went. And that's when his parents Notice what was going on and looked around to see who was causing all this because while my hands were empty, his hands happened to be full of mashed potatoes. <laughs> At the time, he went like this, and I was so busted. <laughs> I had a good laugh. They smiled at me. Thank God they didn't come over and just rebuke me, you know, but it was funny to have, see his cute little face covered with mashed potatoes, wondering what was next, you know, but we had to be done at that moment, and it was so, so fun. Don't you love it when something like that happens and you have this moment? Now, what does that have to do with Christians being made for more, or Christianity, for all that matter? It has nothing to do with it, but it has everything to do with it. Nothing, because I'm not even sure they had mashed potatoes in the time of Christ. They had mashed something for sure. But everything, in that Jesus always insisted that our walk with him be sort of like that moment, that we mimic him, that we copy him. We look at his life, and then we copy it. We practice it. We rehearse it. We mimic it. Our life is about copying the life of Jesus. And a huge mark of the life of Christ was the fact that he seemed to be dead to the need to be recognized, seemingly disinterested in any, at least any pre-resurrection notice or opportunity to be celebrated for what he was and what he had done. That's, of course, the essence of Philippians 2 when it says, he, he didn't count recognition as divine to be something he had to grasp or hold on to, but instead he recognized, I'm, I'm made for more. My purpose is for more than recognition. This is a time for me to surrender and take on the form of a servant. There's Christ's humility, the essence of his ministry, the hallmark of his personality, the core of his being, and where to be going like this. When, excuse me, sorry guys. When he goes like that, like this, when he goes like this, and like this, when he goes like that. Our world runs on swagger and image. That's our culture. But we are made for more. Made for more than swagger and image. And the more for which we are made is modeled, as I've said, in the life of Jesus. We were made for humility. Now that's kind of a lofty word, 
Nobody's saying, no, we're not supposed to be humble. But I've found that I can live all week long knowing conceptually that Christ was humble, he humbled himself, and so I'm supposed to be humbled, I'm supposed to humble myself. Let me, I mean, if you haven't already figured it out or if you didn't read the paragraph that I wrote to get ready for this week's sermon on on our, um, our website, I don't find that to be a natural thing. I need recognition. I'm confessing this to you. I need to be applauded. I struggle when I'm not the funniest guy in the room, and that hasn't happened for a long time, and it almost got me kicked out of junior high school trying to be the funniest. It's all about needing attention, needed to be recognized. When I was, when I was responsible for something good that happened, I didn't like it inside. It was like torture inside to not be recognized for being the essence of what just happened. I mean, that's my internal battle. Some of you have that battle. Some of you are blessed with a more, little bit more natural humility than that. I don't have it. It's my nemesis. I have to fight it. Jesus says, but you're made for more than that. And I've found that I needed some sort of a working definition of humility that I could pull out of my pocket and sort of read or remember with every occurrence during the week. So every engagement with a student at school, every engagement with a coworker in the next cubicle, every engagement with somebody in church, or I need a definition that I can use for humility and then measure and hold myself accountable. And here it is, and I've offered it to you in passing in previous sermons here. But I, I would encourage you to write this down and try to remember it, and then all day long, practice it. Is this being practiced by me? Here's a measure. And humility is the willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be faithful. It's not being insignificant. In fact, that's the rub, isn't it? Even when you are significant to a project or an issue or a moment, we're certainly all quite significant in life. But it's the willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be faithful, or in a secular sense, in order to be effective. It's kind of like remembering the assignment. The assignment is not for me to be applauded. The assignment is for this person to be blessed, or this person to be cared for, or this task to get accomplished. And if me needing recognition for it hinders the accomplishment of it, which it certainly does with regard to the gospel, it certainly does with regard to the way people perceive Christ and understand the church, when we need applause, and it's about the old phrase, it's about us, that hinders the task, doesn't it? When a particular church must be sort of, sort of the king or queen church, and we don't care about the church, because we must be significant, the most significant congregation among all the congregations. It's not humility. It's Mountain View as a As a church willing to be perceived as insignificant, we don't have to get all the press in order for the gospel to move forward, in order for the gospel in the area to move forward, because that's the assignment. The world runs on swagger and image, but we were made for more. We were made for something much higher evolution than that, humility. The willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be faithful. Now, it's hard to talk about humility without what the topic implies, its nemesis, pride. I'm not talking when I talk about pride now because I'm gonna talk pretty quickly about pride. It's not really the focus. I'm not talking about, man, I'm so proud of my son who practiced humility. That's not the kind of pride I'm talking about. That's a good pride. That's a, there's a nobility in that. Like, I'm blessed by my my daughter, I am, lately, my daughter, I put a, something on Facebook, I was in, talking with my daughter, and she's talking about the way she was caring for a friend of hers, and I swelled inside with that healthy kind of pride because there's something in her that was so great. And I put up on Facebook a picture of my daughter, Becca, our daughter, Becca, and I said, may I just say, my daughter is like a superstar, <laughs> because her character is so deep, and she told me about the ministry she's having with this friend who's really hurting, and her friend's marriage is falling apart, and my daughter's there for her, caring for her, and I'm not talking about that kind of pride, but the pride in Scripture 
that is antagonistic to the kind of humility we see in Jesus and the kind of life he asks us to practice. That's the kind of pride I'm talking about. What is pride? We're talking about humility. We talk about humility, we're talking about one of the most basic and important issues of the Christian faith. But we can't talk about it really without addressing at least in passing this idea of pride. Another of the most basic and important issues in the Christian faith, humility and pride. Both very important topics in the Christian faith. So what is pride? Early church fathers and mothers taught that pride is actually the essence. I'm going to trip over this thing if I don't change it. There we go. You don't need a comedy act this morning, and I don't need a broken hip. The early fathers and mothers talked about pride as uh, the essence of all sin. It's like the rootstock of all sin. Pride, uh, C.S. Lewis talked about pride a lot and, uh, and wrote about it. It's linked to insecurity. In fact, it said that pride is insecurity unleashed. Pride is insecurity unleashed. Lewis said pride is the essential vice, the utmost evil, the complete anti-God state of mind. Think about that. The complete anti-God state of mind. Now, listen. Me preaching about humility <laughs> causes some people that have known me over the years, uh, if they're gone, to turn over in their graves. This is, as, this is I'm aspiring to this. It's a, it's a little bit comical if it weren't so sad. Me preaching about humility, but I hunger for it. I practice it. I try, to, I move toward it. But it's the anti-God state of mind to be proud. Because pride is sort of a moment. We, we're usurping the one who should be celebrated when we insist on being the one celebrated. It's un insecurity unleashed. And pride is culture's default position. Of course it is because our world runs on what? Swagger and image. Note this story from a parable of Jesus. And the context is he's teaching about the kingdom of God. Several parables teaching about the kingdom of God in a row. But here's one of them. And in this one parable, he shows you pride and humility in the same parable. And from Luke 18. So this isn't John chapter 6. We'll get there. But Luke 18. He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others as uh, with contempt. Another translation would say he's teaching this parable to people who felt like they could earn their own righteousness, didn't need anybody or anything, and then looked down their noses, one translation says, at everybody else. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I, pray tithe, I pay tithes on all that I get. This swagger and image sort of, I deserve this and isn't God lucky to have me, attitude, is the poster child, was the poster child for religious health. Now here's the sad moment. It, it sort of still is if we're not careful. That's the perception some people have of what used to be called evangelicalism. I'm still searching for a new word because that word has now been ruined, but it, in the old sense of, uh, you know, we're not about who we hate. We're about loving Jesus and, and sharing Jesus and in that healthy sense of, of the word. Sometimes that's still the position, the attitude. We wouldn't say it that way, but we define our spiritual health by the fact that I do this, I do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, and isn't God lucky to have me? And if that's not true, it certainly is true, truly the perception sometimes of the church in our culture.
But Jesus turns that on its ear because his people are made for more. We are made for more. We are made for something that looks lower, but is actually higher, more mature, more evolved. Humility. The willingness to be perceived as insignificant, even when we are profoundly significant, in order to be faithful. Much more. Much, much more. So what is pride? What is humility? If pride is insecurity unleashed, humility is insecurity unheeded. It's there, but we don't heed it. We tell it to sit down and take its place. I've thought a lot about this after 45 years as a pastor and sadly reflected on how many of those years or decades I spent leading out of my insecurities. When I reflect on it, in the moment I couldn't see it. I didn't have the maturity to see it. But in retrospect, when I reflect on it, I think, man, especially when I planted that church up in Oregon when we were working, I think most of my ministry there was in response to my own insecurities, and so I could somehow paint a picture of being a good pastor, and I suppose 75% of what I did was good, but a lot of it, foundationally, I was leading out of my brokenness, my emptiness, my needs. And when leaders lead out of insecurity, people get hurt. Can I get an amen from that? Whether it's in the church, or in business, or in a family, When we lead out of insecurity, our insecurities dominate. When our insecurities are even mildly unleashed, and and that's uh, the commander for our actions and our decisions, people get wounded. And the task isn't really accomplished. If pride is insecurity unleashed, humility is insecurity unheeded. I think I I got that backward just a moment ago. When we lead out of insecurity, when our insecurities are not held in check, when they're unheeded, when they're not unheeded, we we have problems. So insecurity unleashed. It's also said, as I implied earlier, pride is the essence of all sin. It's the the rootstock for all sin. Sin, All sin really comes out of pride, basically. But if pride is the essence of all sin... It's also taught that humility is the essence, the rootstock of all virtues. All virtues come out of this foundation of humility. The practice of humility, which takes great strength and capability and maturity to stand down. Oh, oh, Scripture talks about it in terms of things like dying to yourself. No greater love has a person than someone who has set aside their life for the life of their friend. That's humility. Dying to yourself, that's humility. Taking up your cross daily and following me me up your Golgotha hill, whatever that Golgotha hill is for that day, that's humility. Humility is the essence of all virtue. Note that in the same parable, picking right up where I left off reading before, Jesus says, however, but the tax collector, who would be perceived in this parable as the one who should be not so mature and spiritually deep compared to the Pharisee, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. But he was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Let me, let me get into the weeds of that a little bit. That direct article is really important, the sinner. This certainly wasn't taught by Jesus in Greek. It was taught in either Aramaic or Hebrew, probably Aramaic, which is something of a lost language. And then from that, whoever heard it originally translates it into Greek here. We have it in Greek. And in Greek, the direct article is a big deal because it's not required like it is in English. It could be written, forgive me, without the article at all, which we we would call an indirect article, but they don't have that in Greek. Forgive me, sinner. And it would be translated, forgive me, a sinner. 
But the fact that the direct article is there means whoever translated it into Greek heard it in the original language and then decided that Jesus was trying to make a point like he's saying, like the sinner of all sinners. That's the force with which this person is broken at this place in this parable, this place of prayer. Be merciful to me, not just a common sinner. It's like I'm, I'm the sinner of all sinners. That's the level of humility and brokenness. And then the parable goes on. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself, forgive the lack of inclusive language here. It certainly includes men and women, obviously. For everyone who exalts himself is going to be humbled. But the one who humbles himself, she who humbles herself, will be exalted by the one whose exaltation is worthy of having. And it's interesting to me that this is followed immediately by that little discourse of quit hindering the children from coming unto, unto me, for the kingdom of God is for such as these. Unless you enter it like a child, you will not enter it at all. Remember I said Jesus was teaching about the kingdom and he has this, this juxtaposition of pride and humility. And then right on the tail end of that is this teaching about the children coming as children. Eyes wide open, some of them having to be carried, thumbs still in, in some cases, the picture of humility. And now, I think my favorite expression of humility in the New Testament anyway is the primary text for today, John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. The story, I call it this. It can be the feeding of the 5,000. I, I like to call it the story of the unknown and unrecognized boy. Jody Giles referred to this a couple of Sundays ago when he talked about, um, you know, needing to assess what you have, take inventory of what you have in order to move forward. I'm coming at it from a completely different angle. Same parable, though. Let me read the whole thing and then comment on it. And then we'll move toward the table of communion. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias and a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him. They had had experiences previous to this with needing to feed people and not being enough food and testing to see if these guys had learned anything. This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew exactly what he intended to do. And Philip answers and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. For, for everyone even to receive a little, 200 days work isn't even enough. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says to Jesus, well, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, and then I love the way he covers himself. He's like tipping his toe in the water. Well, there's a, and then he says, but, but what is this to so many people? Of course, it's crazy. So he's kind of like, have it both ways. Let's see if Jesus bites on this, but I'm going to cover myself because it's a crazy notion. And Jesus said, by the way, this is what M Mountain View Church wants to hear Jesus say. Have the people sit down. In other words, this is going to be good. I can do something with this. I'm fixing to do something great. With something that's perceived as not so great. Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number about 5,000. As Jody mentioned a couple weeks ago, it's two or three times that, much, that many people probably. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up, and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over. 
by those who had eaten. And then this text. Listen to this now. Verse 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which Jesus had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. That, I think, is the great miracle. Eyes opened. Oh, my word. This is the one we've been hoping for and looking for. 5,000 plus. So a couple of great things happen in this story. More than 5,000 people fed from one small basket. They had their bellies filled. There's this great miracle that happens, and we're still reading about it, being blessed by it. But then, as I just said in verse 14, more than 5,000 people honored Jesus with recognition and have to think differently about him. We might say, in our language today, thousands were converted or at least took a big step toward Christ. They saw him differently. And you understand, coming to Jesus is actually that. It's coming toward Jesus, step by step by step. This is a big step. That's a profound movement there. That's pretty exciting. We would be celebrating, jumping up and down, screaming, you wouldn't believe what happened last weekend. Thousands of people said, maybe I need to rethink Jesus. We'd be so excited. We'd have a, we'd have a party here, wouldn't we? That's a big deal. All came from an insignificant gift given by a forgotten hero. The willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be what? Faithful, effective, used. And note the word relative insignificance, at least the perceived insignificance of this gift. Of the four Gospels, only John mentions the lad. Only John. So insignificant was his gift that Andrew virtually apologizes for even mentioning it. But what is that to so many people? Eh, probably not. He gave himself an out because it's crazy. Now let me ask you. Remember, thousands of people recognize Jesus for who he is. Thousands of people are fed when they were hungry. Thousands of people saw Jesus as provider. The apostles certainly were deepened in their understanding, faith in, trust in Jesus by this event because this gift was given. Because some boy came probably and said, well, everybody else might go hungry, but my mom packed the lunch, but doggone it, Jesus isn't going to go hungry. Maybe that's what he was thinking. I doubt that he was thinking, I'm going to give this gift. Jesus is going to turn it into a lunch for everybody. He probably was just coming in, not even fully understanding and saying, here, pulled on the robe of one of the apostles and says, sir, I, I, I'm okay without lunch. Here, here, make sure Jesus eats. That's my guess. I'm just reading between the lines. But he, that's a big story. Can we agree that was a huge story? Now, somebody tell me, what was the young boy's name? Come on. Feeding of the 5,000 plus because this boy gave his lunch. What was his name? The hero of the story, humanly speaking, not the apostles. This kid, little kid in a high chair going. Nu, 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 nu. Okay, what was his family name? Anybody? Okay, what village was he from? Do we know? We don't know. And when that's all done, all these 12 baskets are gathered up. I mean, even see the leftovers took two or three camels to move it. And we don't even know his name. Yet this faith of his was the launching pad for one of the most often celebrated miracles of Christ's entire life. Here we are celebrating it. And we don't know the kid's name. And we can only assume that growing up, the boy was fine with that, with not being celebrated. Because like Jesus, I believe he was humble. It was more important to him 
but people recognize who Jesus was, then that he be lifted up on somebody's shoulders and paraded through the crowd, high-fived by everybody for the fact that he gave up his lunch. I rather imagine he said, uh, sir, here's, here's my lunch, at least Jesus can eat. And then they all turned and went toward Jesus and he maybe even got knocked over by the crowd and worked his way back to sit with his cousins and wherever he was sitting and was never recognized again. And the powerful thing is, I think he was okay with it. Humility. The world runs on swagger and image. But we belong to Christ. We were made for more. And unless the church recognizes that we were made for more than that, we were made for humility, the willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be faithful, people will continue to be repulsed by us, not drawn to Christ because of us. Husband, in your marriage, the willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be faithful. Laying my life down for my wife and saying to her, maybe you're right. And even if you're not, it doesn't matter because you mean more to me than me winning the argument. Me showing love and tenderness to you is more important to me than winning the argument. At work, us being a successful company and me as a Christian contributing to that simply because I'll make the best idea presentation and then step back and let the team take the credit. That's Christian action. That's humility. Because the task means more than me. Doing the opposite of that, by the way, is functioning out of our insecurities. It's insecurity unleashed. But humility is insecurity what? Unheeded. And we were made for that. And that is the better choice. Many would say that the world is falling into decay. Many Christians would say, oh, the world is coming apart at the seams. And they see the world as some sort of a battleground where we need to take Christian principles and convictions. And they challenge us. They'll say, come on, where's your conviction? Take a stand. They forget the fact that oftentimes Jesus didn't take a stand. In fact, he retreated to let things kind of evolve. Have convictions. Take a stand. I'm brokenhearted for the world. And I'm certainly in favor of convictions. But I recently came across an interesting definition of arrogance. Arrogance is conviction without humility. Arrogance is truth without love. What did Jesus teach us? What does the scripture teach us? Speak the truth in love, not one or the other. I referred recently to Henri Nouwen's book, In the Name of Jesus. It's a critical book for me, and I'm referring to it again today. He warns in that book against the temptation to be spectacular. There are three temptations he warns against, and this is one. For leaders, that book's about leaders. The temptation to be spectacular. One of my first Sundays here, I referenced how the church, unfortunately, for its leaders, tends to prefer celebrity over substance. By the way, you were made for more than that. Looking for a pastor pretty soon. Search committee's meeting, and I think in a couple weeks, real soon, pray for them. The temptation to be spe- spectacular, and now in was warning against engaging in the essence of all sin and embracing instead the essence of all virtue. Warning against that pride and challenging instead to choose the greater thing, humility. So, yeah, our world runs on swagger and image. It cherishes winning the argument and being applauded for the contributions it makes almost above anything else, certainly above being loving, being gentle, and kind. But we are made for more. 
We are made for what the Father Strickland, a 19th century English Jesuit, said. It's been quoted and claimed by leaders and presidents up into modern history. But as far as researchers can tell, this Jesuit priest was the source of it. We were made for this, where he says, one can do a great deal of good in this world if one does not care who gets credit for it. The church can do a great deal of Christian action in this world if the church quits caring who gets credit for it. A church can experience greatness as the way God defines greatness. If the people who are the church don't care who gets credit for whatever the church does. Oh, a marriage can be wonderful. If marriage partners are laying their lives down and not caring who gets credit for the greatness of the marriage, a workplace can be truly great. You see where this goes? The world runs on swagger and image. The world runs on pride but not us, because we follow Jesus, who laid down his life, didn't consider recognition as divinity something to be forcefully held on to, but not only laid down his life, surrendered all that, but took on the form of a servant, and then the lowest servant possible, in order that people might find life. We are made for more. We are made for the kind of humanity implied in that Jesuit priest's statement. We are made for more than swagger and image. We are made for the virtue of humility, the essence of all virtues, the rootstock of everything good, the willingness to be perceived as insignificant in order to be faithful. We're going to be moving now toward this time of communion, coming to the table. But we want it to be more than a time where you stand in line so that you can come up and get your bread and your juice. We want this, this is purposely part of our liturgy, part of the experience of worship today. And we have people in the corners here that are ready to pray for you if you feel like you need to be prayed for about any issue that's going on, anything going on in your life, certainly about this thing I battle with, like the resistance to surrendering recognition and the need for even more recognition than you deserve. That's my battle. But I've learned and am learning that when that stuff is usurped in me, kind of coming up like bile that's really going to ruin everything it touches... I need to take that feeling and place it in the crosshairs of the gun of the holy assassin so that he can kill it. To say, that must not be allowed to live, Lord, and I have no idea how to defeat it. But here it is, you defeat it. It's low-hanging fruit for us. Kill it and give me the power and the strength to choose humility instead, as crazy and unnatural as it feels inside. There are people here that are ready to pray for you if that's your need. And quit pretending and get whole. Or anything else you want to be prayed for. And then this time of communion, as we're going to be worshiping through music and reflection, don't just stand in line. Reflect while you're in line. Recognize what you're doing. You're moving slowly toward the table. See this as a time where you're moving toward Christ. And in line praying, God, I'm moving toward the actual tactile experience and expression of the master of humility. And as the bread touches your lips and the juice crosses your palate, see it as a renewed call and commitment to something other than the swagger and image that is pouncing on us from every angle. And a reaffirmation of you saying, yes, I was made for more. And I will choose more. And by the way, if you haven't taken that step across the line, 
would have been thinking for some time about, I think, I think I like Jesus. I think his way is a better way to live than what I've been seeing, but I haven't yet committed my life to following him. Maybe this is your first communion as a believer in Christ. Come join us in this crazy challenging walk to be different and to offer a different way and have your sins forgiven. And maybe when you take that bread and juice, it's the same as you saying, Jesus, I don't understand much at all, but I love you and I wanna follow you. And you'll take the bread and the juice and it'll be like your conversion moment, whatever it is. Think as you move toward the table and welcome to a life of humility. God bless you as you come. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to this channel. If you would like to connect with our church or donate to financially support our ministry, visit us at nvc.life.